r slash no sleep posted by you slash strange underscore dangerous i still own a motel and i may have been renting out rooms to a family of vampires every four years for decades part three burn it all down those words rung clear in my heart as if my mother were whispering them in my ear trust me i wanted nothing more than to be done with this the motel and the family but there were some things i just couldn't let go i started to worry that if i sold the motel other secrets would be revealed. Dark secrets. Damaging secrets. I could fill in that pit below their room, but what else was hiding on the motel grounds? I had no choice to but wait for the sale to either go through or fail. In the meantime, I packed up what I could from our old family home. Every photograph of my parents now felt different, less genuine. Why would they keep so much from me? I asked out loud to a room of family artifacts and meaningless mementos. Nobody answered me. Two days passed and I waited for either the boy or the man in the truck to return. Instead, the first car to pull into my parking lot was that of the local sheriff. My body tensed and my mind went to the room and the blood-soaked carpet that I never replaced. I questioned whether or not I'd actually be honest if he asked about it. Yes, of course I would be. I had nothing to hide. I knew nothing. Nothing, except for the fact that I'd rented rooms to soulless immortal creatures that somehow acquired gallons upon gallons of blood without notice. I began to doubt my own composure. I waited at the open door to the office while he sat in the cruiser for 10 minutes or so. I wasn't sure if he saw me or not, but regardless I held my ground. I noticed a little too late, my cleaning supplies abandoned in the lobby next to gallons of bleach. The cruiser door slammed shut and snapped my attention back to him. As he approached he scanned the surroundings, taking note of the unlit vacancy sign. He turned back and registered the curtainless windows of each emptied room, that is of course, except for the families. Afternoon. He said with a tip of his hat. What can I do for you? I asked, as friendly as possible. He removed his shades and peeked over my shoulder into the lobby. Wondering if I could have a moment of your time to ask some questions. He said with a smile. Regarding? Well. He turned back to the mostly empty rooms. You have any guests recently? He asked. Closed down a few weeks back, unfortunately. I said, trying to hide my anxiety. That's not what I asked. He said, smiling again, but this time with menace. Sorry? I apologized. I don't mean to be rude or nothing, but we know Bill Hanley was on his way up here a few days back. Just wondering if he made it. Sorry don't know him. I said, hoping to end the conversation there. You don't know the man who was fixing on buying your place? He asked, again looking back at the family's room. Oh, him. Yeah. Him. He said, prying for more. I uh, my lawyer handled it all. I didn't meet him. I lied. Not even when he stopped here for the night. He asked, showing his cards. I swallowed hard. I wanted to tell the truth, but I wasn't ready for what came with it. Oh, did he drive a truck? I asked. He did. Then yes, I saw it. Parked it over there. I said, foolishly pointing towards the room. The sheriff turned to the room. To the parking spot, to my secrets. He took out a notepad and began to write something down. But he didn't stay with us. We were closed, so he slept in his car. I think. I stuttered. Think? He asked, looking back to me. I didn't see him leave. But yeah, he was here for a bit. If, you know, the truck belonged to him and all. I said, fumbling over my words. It did. He said, putting the notebook away. Mind if I take a look around? Of course not. I said, the words tumbling out of my mouth before my mind could stop them. I stepped aside to sort of let him into the lobby, away from the family's room. Immediately, he took notice of the cleaning supplies and the bleach. Is there a problem? Is he okay? I asked, regretting my words immediately. The sheriff's gaze lingered on the bleach for a very long time. He then turned his attention back to me. I could see his mind working over something. Thinking. Suddenly. It felt as if the air in the room shifted. His entire demeanor changed and I felt an aura of warmth from him. He shrugged and cracked a smile. Well, I figured it's gonna be on the news soon anyway. If it ain't already. What? I asked. Well, nothing good that's for sure. That truck you saw, they found it about 200 or so miles west of here. Off the 80. All the way out there? What was he doing? I asked, feigning surprise. Well, we don't know. We don't know where he is. He said, his gaze drifting now to the knickknacks and photographs. Oh. That's not good. 
I don't like that. I said, truthfully. You really ain't gonna like the next part. That buyer of yours has a lot to answer for. Like what? I asked, cutting him off. Well, the body they found in the cab. Burnt to a crisp. Abandoned. He said, picking up a photograph of myself and my parents. I thought you said he was missing. You sure it wasn't him? I asked, trying to find something to do with my fidgeting hands. Too young, too small to be him. Best we can recon it's a young man they found. No ID though. John Doe. He said, looking hard at the photo. These your parents? I nodded. He looked back at the photo, then back at me. Biological? He asked. I'm told I look more like my grandparents, really. I said. He smiled and returned the photo. I believe he then looked for photos of my grandparents, but there were none. We stood there trapped in a long awkward silence. I motioned towards the kitchen door behind the front desk. Did you still want to look around? I asked, trying to lead him. Nah. Maybe later. Just needed to confirm he was here, really. He said, making his way back outside. I followed. Okay. Well, thank you for stopping by. I said, foolishly. He paused at the door, acknowledging my awkward statement. Then I saw it again, his mind working. He put his sunglasses back on. He was alone here, you said? He asked. I thought hard. What did I tell him? Did I slip? I couldn't remember. I don't know. I said. He looked at me as if he could tell I was lying. Could have been someone else in the truck. It was dark. Can't say for sure. I stammered out. He nodded in acceptance. Thank you for your time. He said. And with that, he was gone. But as he drove by the only remaining curtains still hanging in the motel rooms, he made a point to slow and look as he passed. I waited until he was out of sight and then ran back home as fast as I could. As soon as I reached the bathroom, I vomited. My nerves were a tangle of anxiety and guilt. I knew that the body they found had to belong to the teenage boy, but what about the man? He was either still alive or still here. I searched the motel grounds for any sign of the man, or other secret spots. I wandered past the property line into the clearing and with the sunlight beating down on me I had an epiphany. The teenage boy was on his way to another place like ours. A sanctuary. He would never have let himself get caught outside like that, not on purpose. In all my years of knowing the family, I had never seen them at any time close to dawn or dusk. They were experts at avoiding the sun. Wherever he was going, he couldn't have been far from his destination. I knew what I had to do. I had to find their next stop. I had to know if it was anything like the motel. And if it was, how? Why? Could there be more of those earthen rooms cluttered with crystals and soft dirt, covered in strangely written runes? I had to know. I packed what I could into my small car and locked up the motel. Before I left, I made sure to reload my grandfather's gun and place it in my bag, which I then placed on the passenger seat. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I was fairly certain that if I found anything, I had to be ready. The drive was long, but I drove slowly. I kept an eye out for any building or structure that could hide them. Luckily, the highway was an extension of the one that the motel sat on. It was another dead road. A long stretch of nothing, so spotting anything would be easy. As I passed the 200 mile marker I slowed to a crawl and leaned over my steering wheel. An old barn crept into view around the 220 mark and I knew it had to be there. It was the only building within miles. I pulled into the old dirt road alongside deep tire tracks left when the rain softened it into mud. I stepped out of the car and pocketed the revolver. The sky overhead was grey and made for a dark afternoon. I followed the tracks as they led into the old rotted barn. The heavy doors were in disrepair, but the hinges swung as if they were new. Inside the barn was what you would expect from an antique structure, old brittle hay and rusted equipment were left and forgotten. Everything looked as if it hadn't been touched in decades, everything except for a strange metal watering trough in the center of the barn. The sickening realization of what it was had set in before I even saw the familiar dark rings around the inside. Like the bath in their room, this had been filled with blood. The ground surrounding the trough was stained from decades of crimson ichor seeping into it. As I stepped close, the ground bowed beneath my feet and the wood groaned. I stomped. The hollow echo of an empty chamber could be heard below. I kicked aside the dust and hay to reveal the trapdoor. There was less effort put into hiding this one, but then again the location itself was a hiding spot. I found the finger holes and pulled up the door. That familiar scent of smoke, stale breath and iron wafted up. I pulled the revolver from my pocket and climbed down. 
The room was smaller than the one below the motel, but it was very much the same. Odd words were again carved into the walls, but wood replaced brick in this more ramshackle construction. The strange crystalline rocks were placed around the room in a pattern I hadn't noticed beneath the motel. There were fewer here, but enough to catch my eye. I pulled one out of the dirt and held it in my hand. Soft dusted salt seemed to rub off with the slightest touch. It was heavy in my hand, more than you would expect. I held it into the light for my phone, there were dark red and blue mineral veins streaking through the otherwise milky white crystal. It was so dry it felt as if it sucked the moisture from my fingertips. I pocketed it and continued on into the darkness. My foot sunk into an exceptionally soft batch of dirt. I realized I was standing on one of the earthen mounds, same as the seven in the motel chamber. One however, was unlike the rest. The dirt was discolored and more dry than the other mounds. There was also a fleck of white protruding just beneath the gray unfertile soil. Hunched over I made my way to the dying mound and uncovered a note written on a white piece of paper. A white piece of paper that just so happened to be stationary from our motel. It read, Father, if you have found your way here, I am sorry. We waited for three days, but the fire burned so hot, Master said you could not return. I begged her to wait, but the soil grew damp and we had to move on. If you've made it here, you know about the orphan. Our oldest home is in danger. In my slumber, I still feel your presence, so I have hope you will find us soon. Hopefully so, as we have left you a meal in the old farmhouse, far from the road. I hope that it gives you the strength to find us again. Matthew. I left the note where it laid. The farmhouse in question was far from the barn, but I worried that driving up might bring unwanted attention. I walked through waist-high grass on the untilled soil of dead farmland. This plot of land had been long forgotten. The house itself was in better condition than the farm, but not by much. It had been lived in recently, but how recent I couldn't be sure. It was far from the highway and isolated in a way only rural homes can be. I approached from the side of the home and peered through the dust-covered windows. The decor had a timeless untethered look and it was unclear if it had been abandoned for years or if the residents just had peculiar taste. Regardless, I saw no signs of movement inside. I thought about entering through the window, but caught myself and did the rational thing. I knocked on the front door. I thought I heard a brief flurry of restrained movement somewhere inside the house. My hand went immediately to the revolver. My voice was knotted and stuck in my throat. I swallowed hard and tried to call out, but my nerves wouldn't allow it. Instead I reached out for the doorknob and the moment my fingers made contact, the door drifted open. It felt as if I were being invited inside. My shoes slipped slightly on an old pile of mail stacked up from years of neglect. Some were postmarked from as far back as the late 90s. My first instinct about the decor was correct. Thick layers of dust seemed to coat most things in the home, but certain spots had been wiped clean with use. A path in the hallway rug was worn down from recent footsteps. I followed them to the kitchen. There were dishes in the sink and a box of discontinued cereal on the counter next to an empty jug of milk. The power had long ago been shut off and the contents of the fridge had rotted past the state of decay and no longer even smelled. The ashtray on the kitchen table however, was packed full of fresh butts. A single unsmoked cigarette was left next to a matchbook. One thing became obvious, the meal was not left in the kitten. Hello? I called out, adjusting my grip on the revolver. A metallic rattle and a pained moan came from somewhere in another room. I stepped carefully in the direction of the ghostly noise. I could hear a subtle rhythmic tapping coming from behind the door of the room at the end of the hallway. The distance to the door felt longer than the distance from the house to the barn. The long drawn out moan seemed to seep out from beneath the cracks in the door. I removed the gun from my jacket pocket and with my other hand I carefully opened the door. The ghoulish noise ceased in the moments that the door opened, replaced by the squeak of unused hinges. I stepped back and aimed. But it was just a bathroom. The soft blue and pepto-pink tiles were not the horror I expected on the other side of the door. The pipes beneath the sink let out another ghostly moan as they groaned from unuse and the steady drip of a leaky faucet pattered behind the shower curtain. I understand now that it was not the brightest idea, but I had driven for hours and I had no other options, none that would provide the comfort of a seat. So I placed the gun on the sink and sat down. I only had a moment of relief before I saw the silhouette behind the semi-opaque shower curtain. I pushed on the curtain thinking it was just a trick of the light, but my hand made contact with something solid. Before I could stand, the silhouette formed into the figure of person as it reached out towards me. I stood quickly, but a withered white hand covered in blood emerged from the shower. I tripped and grasped for anything to catch myself. I grabbed hold of the only thing standing between myself and the figure, the shower curtain. 
As I fell back, the curtain tore from the rings and fell onto me. Frantically I crawled backwards out from under the curtain and out of the room, away from the gun. I pulled my pants up and struggled to my feet, realizing that the thing standing in front of me was not pursuing me. Instead, the emaciated figure of a dead man hung suspended above the bathtub, swaying slightly from my push. The room began to spin as the horror of what was in front of me became clearer with the sound of every wet drop of blood dripping into the bath. He was the meal. I grabbed the gun and before I knew it, I was already outside. I considered my options. I thought about burning it down, but that would only bring attention. I knew nothing about fingerprints and fire and evidence. The safest option was to do nothing. This house had remained hidden for so long, why wouldn't it stay that way? Just to be safe though, I took the shower curtain and wiped down any surface I remembered touching. I locked the door from the inside and closed it. The walk back to the barn was long and arduous. I replayed the images in my mind over and over and thought back to the bathtub I had cleaned so many times before. If there were any doubt in my mind before, it had been erased. The family that I had known my whole life were no longer human. They truly were creatures of the night that preyed on the weak and drank their blood. It should have been obvious, and maybe it was. Maybe my parents knew all along. They had too. But me, it had only coalesced in my mind after seeing the body. It became clear as day. Every four years, for a week at a time, I had been in the presence of an unearthly evil. They were inhuman, unnatural and otherworldly. They were vampires. We were just one stop on their tour of death. They must have other places like ours, just close enough to make it in a night's drive. My aunt lived only a few hours east of us. My memories of visiting her came flooding back. It now made sense that I every time I stepped into the guest house behind her home, the cellar door would smell of smoke, stale breath, iron and every once in a while, soft lavender too. It seems now that my aunt did what my parents couldn't. That is probably why they left her that last letter. They knew that she would be capable of doing what they never could. They had made the deal and tolerated slaughter under their roof, but part of me understood why. Even if they wanted to burn it all down, she was still their little girl and she needed a safe place. As I stood in front of the burn pit out back behind the motel, I watched the plastic shower curtain curl and melt in the flames. A flicker of light off glass caught my eye just outside the center of the fire. I used a stick to dig it out. Glasses. Thick rimmed glasses. He was never coming back. Bill Henley, the man who was going to purchase my motel was not coming back. Like it or not, this motel was still mine. And as far as I knew, I still had four years to figure out what to do with it.